to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Stand to your feet and worship the Lord with us.
Jesus. Amen and amen. You may be seated. You know, the conviction that Jesus is coming back and can come back right now is not as strong as it once was, but it needs to be renewed. There's two reasons why we ought to want Jesus to come. One of them is this world is getting pretty wicked. And we don't like living in it. And we'd like to get out of it. But that is not the number one reason why we ought to want Jesus to come. We want him to come because we love him. We want him to come because we'll enter into an eternal relationship with him that we cannot have on this earth. We're going to be changed and made totally like him. And we're going to have a new body like his. Let the conviction that Jesus may come today and let there be a desire and a hunger and a longing for Jesus to come. As the Apostle Paul said, he said, I'm kind of hung up between two things here. One On one side, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is a whole lot better. Nevertheless, it's more needful for you that I remain. And so it's important that we understand we've got a mission and we've got a work to do on this side of the coming of the Lord and let us be faithful and fulfill what God has called us to do and be a blessing to those that are on this earth while we're waiting for Jesus to come. Can you say praise the Lord? Hallelujah. Thank God he's coming. Well... That's my sermon. I just thought I'd give it to you early. Special prayer for, for Jody Young. I almost said Juanita Young. That's her mother. It's been passed on for a long, long time. But we're thinking about you, Sister Juanita. Praying for Jody Young. Ron and Ann Wittenberg. Uh, Ann uh, came home and... Uh, Today, they were able to get her in rehab uh, so that they can help her take care of her because she was having difficulty taking care of herself. So we thank God for that answer to prayer. And for Kelly Evans, Pamela Vick, Dale Ennis, Billy Crabtree, uh, Carla, who is Sister Brown's niece, uh, Pam Gurley, Mike Bailey, Linda Reed's great-grandson Miller, and we j I just got a report a while ago that the reports came back on him, and he does not have what they thought he had. They thought he might have cystic fibrosis. Was that what it was? Anyhow, they had, anyhow it came back, and uh, the first reading was not right. The sec uh, second one was what we wanted to hear. And we know what went on in between the two, don't we? <laughs> Amen. God has a way of, of messing up machines. Praise God. So we praise God for that today. And then we want to pray for Mary Mitchell and uh, Lena Potts, Becky Smith and family, Lacey Harrison, and Brother James Nichols, and Ali Ramos. And uh, Sister Patricia Barton is having a total knee replacement on April the 24th. Our Father, we thank you for these as we hold them up to you that you're mindful of them. We thank you, Father, that you care about them. We thank you, Father, that you've told every one of them and us to cast our cares upon you. And tonight I pray, Father, that they will cast their care upon you. They'll let you take care of it. You're capable. You've already done it. And in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the healing that you've already accomplished for them. And we believe that it is passed on and becomes a manifestation in their physical bodies tonight. 
wherever they are, let that experience of healing take place at this very moment while we pray and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' wonderful and beautiful name and everybody said, amen. The ushers are coming to wait upon you for our Wednesday evening tithe and offerings. God is a faithful giver. God is a giver. He's not a taker. Did you hear that? God is not a taker. He's a giver. And if it seems like he's took something, he's going to give it back to you, and it's going to be a whole lot more than what you thought he took from you. Because God wants you to be blessed. He came to give you life. Give it abundantly. Amen. Father, thank you for the gift and the giver tonight. Thank you for your blessing upon your people. And I thank you, Father, for the prosperity of your people. I thank you, God, for the blessings of finances upon this church. And we give you the glory and the praise for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Mark chapter 6, verse 48, it says, And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary to them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them walking upon the sea, and would have passed them by. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, and cried out, I'm glad to know that he knows my voice. I'm glad to know that when I cry out, he hears me. And that has stood out to me. He knew they were there, but it said he, they, he would have passed them by, but he heard them cry. And no matter what you're going through, you can cry out to him. He knows your voice. Listen to the words of your cries has awoken the master.
as I walk through the doors, I sensed his presence, and I knew this was the place where love abounds. For this is the temple, Jehovah God, you body. And we are standing, we're standing in His presence on hope.
Amen. Just worship him in his presence, in his presence, in his presence. There is joy in his presence. There is peace in his presence. Oh, yes. All our needs, all our needs are met in his presence. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you ready tonight? Hallelujah. Let's read it together. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. Here we go, one, two, three. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of it. When we read it and we hear what we read and we believe what we hear, thank you, Father, that your word comes to pass and becomes a reality. In Jesus' name, bless your people tonight. Increase our faith that we may be sufficient to face everything that is coming against us in this hour. For we're not defeated. We have the victory, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. And I thank you tonight for providing us a means of living by faith and living by that which we cannot see with our physical eyes, but we know it more than what we actually see with our physical eyes. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, praise the Lord. You may be seated. Last week, I started out on the first part of the law of faith. And we understood that one of the laws of faith is obedience. Faith requires obedience. The Bible tells us that if we say we have faith and we have no works or no obedience, then our faith is dead. And if you're disobedient, your faith is dead because you're violating the law of faith, the law that makes faith work. One of them is obedience. And so we must obey, and that's a part of being a person of faith, is to walk in obedience. Amen? And so the Bible teaches us that there is a law of faith. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 27, the verse before is talking about justification and asking the question in verse 27 and says, are you justified? Or by, I ask the question, what law are you justified by? And he asks the question, are you justified by the law of works? And his answer to that was no. But then he said, you're justified by the law of faith. And so sometimes we think if anything mentions the law, 
It does not belong in the New Testament. But everything is governed by laws. This building is standing up because it has been built according to the laws that govern structure. And if those laws had been violated, this would not be a safe place to be. So everything is governed by laws. And there is a law that governs faith. And that's what we're talking about uh, during this, these Wednesday nights. Tonight, I'm going to talk about the, the uh, source of the law of faith. The source of the law of faith. Where does it have its roots in? And what is it that makes faith work? You see, a, 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 the authority of a law is found in its source. Now, I can go down town and I can stand in the middle of the street and I can say, I am declaring a brand new law that nobody can drive down this street. Now then, the authority of that law is determined by the source. And the source does not have the authority. So the authority of a law is determined by the source of that law. And so when we talk about the law of faith, we want to find out what the source of the law of faith really is. Now then in this scripture that we read together tonight, that without faith it's impossible to please God. Now that's a statement that we have to get hold of. That we cannot please God unless what we do is done in faith. In fact, there's one verse that says, if it's not done in faith, it's sin. And that's a shocker. And what it's doing when it emphasizes faith, it is de-emphasizing flesh. Because when we live by faith, we do not live by the senses. We do not live by what we see. We do not live by what we hear. We don't live by what we feel. We're not governed by natural senses. That's called the flesh. It's called the natural man. And we cannot please God trying to obey his word with our natural strength and our natural energy. So flesh and faith are opposites. And we don't want to live in the flesh. We want to live by faith. We want to be able to see things that we can't see. If we depend upon what we can only see in the flesh, we're going to live in fear. We're going to struggle helplessly and hopelessly trying to do something about it. But when we live by faith, we see what our physical eyes cannot see. And faith always sees victory. That's why the Bible says that this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. The victory that overcomes the world, you cannot see with the natural eye. And what you see with the natural eye would make whatever's coming against you appear that it is overcoming you. But when you have faith, you don't live by what you see. You're not moved by what you see because you see into the invisible realm of the spirit world where every victory has already been won and God doesn't have to do any more. When Jesus died on the cross, rose from the dead, everything was completed and there's nothing else for him to do. He's waiting on you and I to approach him by faith and if man comes to God, he must come by faith. He that comes to God must there's that law thing in it, that must. He that comes to God must believe that he is. 
Two things are in that verse. Believe that he is. Second, believe that he's a rewarder. And many times we bypass coming before him first as he is. And we're just always going to the reward part of this thing. But we need to focus upon him, not just upon what he can do. He wants to be honored. He wants to be Lord. He wants to be worshiped. And so he that comes to God must believe that he is. And so the law of faith requires us to believe that he is. Now let me go a little further with that now. We must believe that God is the creator. Genesis 1 and 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And we could talk about all kinds of things there, but it's not believing in evolution. You can't, you can't approach God believing that, that all of this thing just evolved. You can't approach God and come to God believing that all of the things that we see in the heavens and the earth happen because of some explosion or some collision or even from some tadpole. No, when we come in faith to God, we have to believe that he is because Hebrews 11 in verse 3, as I mentioned this last week, that we believe that by faith we believe the worlds were framed by the word of God. The worlds were not created by a collision or by a tadpole or by some uh, monkey. I don't believe we've evolved from monkeys. I think we're evolving back to monkeys. But we must believe that God is the creator of the heavens and the earth, then we must believe that the creator God is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1 and 3, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have to believe that Jesus is the son of the creator God that the creator God is his father. And if we don't believe that, we're not gonna even be saved. We have to believe that Jesus is the son of the living God who is the creator and that God is his father and that there is no earthly man that had anything to do with Jesus being born. He is the son of God. We must, that's a law of faith, that we must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then he that comes to God must believe that the Creator God is your Heavenly Father. 2 Corinthians 6 and 18, the Lord said, Come out from among them. Be separate. And you shall be my sons and daughters. And I will be your father. When you approach God, you've got to believe that he's your heavenly father. And that you're his child. Because faith requires that. Don't come to God as just your creator. He is your creator, but through Jesus, God has become more personal than your creator. He's more than creator to you. He is your heavenly father, and your heavenly father knows every need that you have, and your heavenly father supplies every need that you have. And if a child knows how to ask their earthly father for good things, and that earthly father knows how to give good things, then the Bible says, how much more does your heavenly father know and give 
good things to his children. We have to believe that we're just not his creation, but that we've been born again. And when we were born again, we became children of God. We became children of the Most High. We are not just creation. We are sons and daughters of God. All the sinners in this world are creation. They are under the creator God. God is their creator, but they haven't come to know him as their heavenly father. But one day we surrendered our heart to the Lord Jesus Christ and he saved us and changed us uh, and we were born again uh, and we were born into the family of God and we became heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Uh, we are the children of the living God. He is our heavenly father. Faith requires that a person be a child of God before it'll work. Doesn't work for the world. Have to be a child of God. Hallelujah. Oh, so many things to say about so many things. I, I, don't, I don't know what it would be like to just have a congregation somehow and have enough anointing that strengthens my old body that I could just uh, have perfect liberty to take all the time I wanted and just uh, chase every rabbit that jumps up and, and just go here and go there and say everything that runs through my mind. Apparently the apostle Paul did that. He preached all night. Midnight a guy fell out the window and broke his neck. Paul stopped his preaching, went and prayed for him, raised him from the dead and got back up and kept on preaching. I tell folks, if you fall out the window on me, you just go on to heaven. I'm not going to pray for you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. But we must believe that Jesus has redeemed us from every curse that sin ever brought into the world that we live in. Galatians 3 and 13, Jesus has redeemed us from every curse. If you want to receive from God, a law of faith is that you must understand and believe that Jesus was made a curse for us and that every curse that sin brought upon mankind was placed upon Jesus and he was cursed with your and mine curses. I don't know, uh, don't judge my grammar here. I don't, I don't know to what extent, but I do know that your curses and my curses were placed upon him and he bore every curse. He was made a curse for us. And when we come to him, that's a law of faith. We must believe that. And when we believe it, we won't make peace with the curses that are trying to attach themselves to us. Amen? Amen. We must believe that Jesus was resurrected from the dead so that he could live in us and through us so that he might fill us with the living reality of the victory that he gained for us when he died on the cross. Did you get that? Jesus is resurrected so that he can live in you and through you and fill you with the living reality of the victory that he won for you when he died on Calvary. Believe that. Hallelujah. And if you believe that, you'll expect victory. You'll expect to overcome. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. 
Hallelujah. You know, the blood of Jesus is the life source. Remember, I'm talking about the source of the law of faith tonight. The blood of Jesus is the life source of the New Testament and the New Covenant. Because 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 25, Paul giving understanding about receiving the Lord's Supper, quoted Jesus. And Jesus said on that last supper that he was with the disciples, he took the cup that had the juice in it, the fruit of the vine. And he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. And so the New Testament, testament is a legal word. That's why we have to bring law into faith because faith is dealing with a legal system. God is a judge, that's legal. Jesus is our advocate, that's legal. And so we have to understand the Bible as a legal document. And when we understand that, we'll understand what I'm gonna say in a little while. But testament is a legal word. There's a law that governs testament. Testament is also covenant. We could call it not just the New Testament, we could call it the new covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's sealed in the blood of Jesus. And without the blood of Jesus, the covenant, the New Testament, would be of no benefit. The Scripture teaches us that the legal law says that when somebody makes a will or a testament, then it is of no effect until the one who made the testament dies. And so the New Testament would be of no effect without the death of Jesus who made it. And when he died, then that New Testament became effective. But in the legal system, there is always an executor of the will. And Jesus arose from the dead and became his own executor. <laughs> and he ever lives to make intercession and to guarantee that everybody gets what he willed for them to have. He is the legal executor of his own will and it's blood sealed, it is blood soaked and the New Testament is alive and living because of the living blood of Jesus. Oh, yeah, hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We're blood bought. That means we've been purchased. We've been redeemed. The Bible says in Acts 20 and verse 28, I'll not quote the whole verse, but it says that the church of God was purchased with God's blood. The blood that Jesus shed was not man's blood. It was not of the blood that had life and death in it. Your blood and my blood has life and death in it. And the blood that's in us is the life of our whole body. But also, there is death in that blood. And while we're living, we're also dying. But the blood of God that was in Jesus' veins had no death in it. It was living because it was the blood of God. And the blood that Jesus shed was the blood of God 
it was a living blood, if it's the blood of God, it is the eternal blood. It still lives today. It is sprinkled upon the mercy seat in heaven and we can come boldly to the throne of grace where the blood of Jesus has been sprinkled and we can find grace and mercy to help us in our time of need because the blood is alive. It's the blood of God. Therefore, The blood of God has redeemed us, purchased, bought us back. And that simply means that our debt to sin and our debt for sin has been canceled and stamped, paid in full. Romans 8 and 13 says, we're not debtors. We don't owe the flesh anything. We don't owe the flesh any obedience. We don't owe the flesh any allegiance. We don't have to walk after the flesh. Because of the blood of Jesus We have been redeemed. We have been purchased. Jesus, with his blood, bought us back. Jesus is the last Adam. And the first Adam was in the Garden of Eden. And he sold us to the devil. When the devil deceived him, and he ate the fruit that was forbidden. You see, there was a law even in the Garden of Eden. And God said of all these trees, you have a lawful right to eat of. But there's one tree in the middle of the garden that it is not lawful for you to eat of it. And if you break that law, you're gonna die. And the devil deceived them into breaking that law because he knew if he could get Adam to break that law and to sin, then he could come back and he could take back control of this earth because that was the domain he had when he was an archangel. His domain was the earth, and he lost it whenever he sinned against God. But now the the first Adam comes along, and now the first Adam is the Lord of this earth, and the devil deceives him, and the devil takes back the lordship of this earth and is referred to as the God of this world in the New Testament and Adam sold us to the devil, but Jesus comes along uh, as the last Adam, uh, and he shed the blood of God, uh, and the blood of God has redeemed us, hallelujah, and canceled the debt. We don't owe the devil anything. The devil has no squatter's right. This is God's property. There was a time when the devil owned it. But Jesus bought us back. And now this body, my soul, my spirit, belongs to God. I'm his property. And the devil has no squatter rights. We hear a lot about squatters today. And takes them sometimes two years to get them out. But I'm here to tell you, Jesus will get them out instantly the minute that you exercise the law of faith that claims the law of possession and Jesus is the lawful owner of this property and when you call Jesus, Jesus will come and he will get rid of the devil. He'll give you power to throw him out. The blood is the source of the authority of the law of faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Let me skip a little here. Oh, I've done wonderfully. If I would quit now.
There's a term that I grew up hearing when I was a kid, and then through the years it kind of, I didn't hear it much, and now it's returning, and it's the word plead the blood. Now then, understand this, we're talking about the law of faith. We're talking about a legal system. New Testament is a legal term. God is the judge, a legal term. Jesus will judge the believers, a legal term. And so there's a law of faith, and there are spiritual laws. And those spiritual laws work, but we need to understand that it's never just words. We need to know what those words mean. And those words are a legal term. And they're a part of the law of faith. We plead the blood. We plead the blood. Pleading the blood is a gift from heaven. It's a resource that God has given to us that gives us authority over all the works of the devil. And we can plead the blood and in so doing, the law of faith will manifest itself through the pleading of the blood and we'll defeat the devil. And we use this pleading the blood as an attorney or lawyer would use it in a courtroom. It's a legal term. The law of faith has some legal terms in it. New Testament is a legal term. And so we have to understand the legal system that God operates by. There's a law of sowing and reaping that God has established. It's one of his laws. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. You sow to the Spirit, you reap life everlasting. You sow to the flesh, you're going to reap damnation. So there's a law that governs that. You can expect it. If you sow it, it's coming back. That's a law. So God operates within this legal system that he has established, even in the natural world. I mentioned last week about the law of gravity and so on. But an attorney or a lawyer in a, in a courtroom, he pleads his case on the basis of the body of evidence that he has. If he makes a plea, he has to show the evidence. If somebody pleads not guilty, they're going to have to provide the evidence. And so a plea that is made on a, on a legal basis has to have evidence. And when you use the term, I plead the blood, you are declaring to the devil. And when the devil accuses you of the sins of your past, You plead the blood over that accusation because the devil cannot find any evidence because the blood of Jesus whew, the blood of Jesus has canceled every sin of your past when you repent in faith believing it is gone. And God, if he tries to look for it, he says, well, I, everything I see here is not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. The devil cannot produce any evidence. Your evidence is the blood. What evidence do I have that I'm not guilty? It's the blood. What evidence do I have that my debt to sin is canceled? It's the blood. 
and I plead the blood. The blood bought this body. The blood bought my soul and my spirit. And devil, you are a trespasser. You have no right to touch my body. You have no right to possess my body. You have no right to possess my spirit. You have no rights at all because my body and my soul has been bought with the blood of Jesus and I plead the blood and you cannot resist the power of the blood. The blood is the evidence. The blood is the source of the authority of the law of faith. Amen? Got it? Well, I'm going to quit then. I'm not going to be like the salesman that talked you into buying something and kept saying, kept talking until he Talk you out of it. Theological training teaches a preacher to know when to stand up, when to speak up, and when to shut up. And I've already told you I didn't have any theological training. I didn't know how to speak up, and as soon as I learned how to do that, <laughs> I didn't learn the others. <laughs> Hallelujah. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. Plead the blood. It's not a saying. It's not a cliche. It is not just words. It's truth. And when you speak it understanding that you're dealing with a devil who has hijacked and claimed for his what is not his. And when he understands that you know that you've been purchased, you've been redeemed, and that it doesn't belong to him, and that you have the right to tell him to take up his weapons and go. You can't camp here, devil. You can't squat here. I have a legal right to the fullness of the blessing of the gospel. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm feeling do daddies or do diddies or whatever they are. Hallelujah. They're not goosebumps. Hallelujah. Woo. Woo. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. Yeah, why don't you just stand up and feel them too, okay? Hallelujah. Oh, Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence. Woo. Hallelujah. 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 The blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. Hallelujah. Let's just worship him for a few minutes. Hallelujah. Just lead us in something. Yes. Yes. I'm a child. I'm a child of the King. Hallelujah, sing it with us. Yes. Oh, yes. I'm, I'm a child. child Let me just pray a little while here. You agree with me when I pray. You agree by saying amen, yes, or whatever. I don't know what I'm going to pray. I'm just going to start. Father, I praise you tonight for the blood. I thank you that your blood is so powerful. We can't even grasp it. Reveal to us the power of your blood. 
Reveal to us that that blood has totally, completely, fully redeemed us from everything that will hinder us. No curse. And I pray for somebody in particular tonight, Father, that has made peace with a curse. They know it's not something that's of God, but they've kind of made peace with it. But in the name of Jesus, I ask you to help them to agree with this prayer and with everybody in this room that no longer will they accept that curse. Be loosed. Be loosed from that curse. Go free. Hallelujah. Father, your hand, your hand, your hand. Somebody some, somebody has had this very thought. I just need a helping hand. And whatever you need a helping hand in, the Lord says to you tonight, my hand is stretched out upon you right now. Just reach out and grasp my hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That helping hand. That helping hand is the hand of Jesus. That helping hand is a nail scarred hand. Where that precious blood once flowed. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. Let him lift you. Let him lift you. Let him lift you. Lift up your head. Don't look down in gloom. He is the lifter up of your head. Thank you, Father, for doing that for somebody. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Would you just come and gather around these altars and, and just let God touch your heart? If God spoken to you in any way. Well, just come. If you want more prayer, I'll pray for you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. God is good. We plead the blood. We plead the blood. Yes, 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 yes.